Coming up next on Twill, I'll be talking with Jeff Garzik and Jonathan Peters. We'll be talking about government transparency, the NSA, the death penalty, and Bitcoin. All that and much more on This Week in Law. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Law is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twill, This Week in Law with Denise Howell and Evan Brown. Episode 260, recorded May 23rd, 2014. Transparent Bitcoins. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 260 of This Week in Law. I'm Evan Brown, hosting the show This Week while Denise is out. We've got a really fun conversation, as usual, on tap for today. So let's get right to it. Let me introduce you to our guests. First, say hello to Jeff Garzik. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for having me. It's great to see you, Jeff. And you know, Jeff, I'm going to let you in a little bit do most of the talking about what it is you do, who you are, what you call yourself, because, you know, you seem to defy easy categorization. But, you know, you, you self-identify as a, a Linux kernel engineer and a Bitcoin core developer and an armchair foreign policy nerd. So those sound like some really interesting combinations. So looking forward to, to talking to you and, and fleshing out some some interesting issues about Bitcoin and uh, other things today. So thanks for being here with us. Thank you. I'm definitely all over the map. Right on, right on. So i uh, like to welcome back to the show, Jonathan Peters. Hi, Jonathan. Hey, Evan. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, it's good to see you again. Jonathan is, uh, gosh, you're, you're all over the map too. A, an attorney, a journalist, a professor. Uh, currently, you're in Columbus, Ohio, but I hear you're moving later this summer, right? Where are you headed in, in August? That is right. Yeah, I'm, I'm moving to Lawrence, Kansas uh, to be an assistant professor of journalism at the University of Kansas and then to do uh, research on internet governance in the KU Information and Telecommunication Technology Center. So moving from Ohio to Lawrence pretty soon. Very cool. Very cool. So, yeah, Jonathan is the press freedom correspondent for the Columbia Journalism Review, and uh, as he mentioned, headed to the University of Kansas uh, later this later this summer. So great to have you guys. Let's get into it. Let's talk first about Bitcoin. Uh, always an intriguing subject. And Jeff, it's great to have you here. Few people on the planet know more about Bitcoin than you do. We established that fact uh, talking, or we established that assertion, got that right before our conversation started. Let me just start by throwing over the question to you. Why is Bitcoin so disruptive? Take it from there. Well, it's uh, really uh, to uh, steal a line from uh, Mark Andreessen. It's the first time that we've copy, uh, conquered the problem of being able to send a digital file across the ether to someone else and securely transfer the ownership of that. So securely transfer digital property without any third party. Whether, you know, usually we have either PayPal we're familiar with uh, as a third party to transfer value uh, on their system. And uh, Bitcoin uh, solved that problem of, uh, for example, if you're going to design digital cash, you have to first figure out, well, I have that file on my hard drive. Can't I just copy it and thereby copy $20 to my grandmother and then copy it again and give that $20 to my mother? Why can't I do that? And Bitcoin really solved that problem of securely transferring digital property. So that the first uh, application, shall we say, of that technology is a currency. And that's what you hear about in the headlines, Bitcoin. But it's also a technology, sort of a uh, register of assets or a register of ownership, if you will. And the first application of that technology is a currency. So I, I probably already melted everyone's brains. Uh, uh, so uh, <laughs> looping back to the beginning, my two word uh, explanation of what is Bitcoin is it's digital cash. It's digital it, it, cash. 
and you say it's more than a currency or more precisely what you what I think I've heard you say here today is that the first application of it is as a currency. When we look to the future, what other applications might we see of it? Or another way of saying it is, what is it besides a currency? It's not just a currency. What else is it? Well, the uh, Bitcoin, the technology uh, is essentially a, a register of ownership. It's in the cloud, uh, air quotes, of uh, whoever owns various Bitcoins. Now, a Bitcoin is just a simple digital token, and that digital token can represent itself, which is value, Bitcoin, the currency, or in the future, we can assign a digital token to a car or a house or a subscription to a magazine. And so from there, you can imagine any digital, any item in the real world, which can be associated with a digital item, can then become private property that's easily transferred to anyone else in the world with a simple digitally signed message. So it's, it's uh, Bitcoin, the currency, was really the first application of this uh, register of deeds or register of assets technology that's uh, so, uh, so powerful and so disruptive in, uh, through uh, one of many qualities, but one of the qualities is its decentralization, its resilience. Right, because if you design a centralized system where uh, there's a single person, a single administrator who is regulating the transfer of, let's say, houses between owners in a community. I just uh, bought a house in my community in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, Bitcoin posits that instead of a central administrator, you have thousands and thousands of individual nodes cross-checking each other to verify that Jeff Garzik did indeed purchase a house from this previous owner. So it's, it's really a very, very general technology, and the, that's why it's so disruptive, is the currency is just the first of many applications which trickle their way into contracts in the legal world, private property rights, autonomous agents and robotics and uh, other second and third order uh, effects down the line. So uh, that's why uh, you see uh, many uh, venture capitalists in Silicon Valley really diving into this as uh, a technology, not as purely a currency. What are we going to see from Fortune 500 companies in the, in the f next few years? You know, making use of of this of this technology because I've heard you forecast that that's it's going to be, you know, even much more much more mainstream. Certainly, people are becoming more aware of it these days. More people certainly know about it now than they did a year ago. But when is it really going to get to that point where you know people's grandparents are going to be, uh, you know, using the, the the technology with with ease and not without giving much thought to it. Um, that is uh, always the question uh, that's uh, put to technologists. Uh, early adopters are always willing to uh, dive into these uh, ugly uh, user interfaces, which are incomprehensible to anyone but uh, uh, computer nerds. And so how do you bridge that gap from there to uh, you know, your aunt, your uncle, your grandmother? And uh, really the back end of most Fortune 500 companies is where this technology is first introduced introduced. And so, for example, uh, if you have a multinational company, they uh, typically transfer funds between uh, individual subsidiaries in, that, in uh, each country. And to do that, they use a, a host of banks, a host of uh, bank accounts, each of which must settle against each other and balance across multiple countries, whereas uh, Bitcoin is really... Uh, perhaps excluding gold itself, really the first uh, global currency, certainly one of the first global digital currencies. And uh, being borderless, you really uh, introduce a lot of efficiencies which uh, otherwise uh, are very cumbersome and have to go through three, four, six counterparties as you're crossing borders. It's now as simple as an email to just transfer digital value or you know, in the future digital property between two individuals. 
So uh, there, there is that. But over and above that, in terms of uh, trust, Bitcoin really uh, posits some new trust relationships at, uh, at various levels in, for example, corporations and businesses. Uh, to uh, be concrete, one of the features of Bitcoin is that you can require multiple signatures on a transaction before that transaction can mathematically be spent. So is this what you, might, you is this what we we call the smart contract? We were talking about that earlier. Is this a genre of this of, is of what a you're very about there? simple example of a smart contract where we might see the CTO, the CEO, and a treasurer must all uh, approve a transfer of funds, or the uh, Bitcoin protocol will simply reject that fund transfer. So it's uh, mathematically provably either all or none from the funds transfer perspective. There's no uh, you know, if uh, one of the parties is corrupted, under duress, uh, uh, or any, anything of that nature, then the funds can't be transferred. So I want it, to come it, back. Oh, sure, please. sure. And that's yeah, just wanna... a very simple example of a smart contract where multiple parties are agreeing and it's digitally provable whether they've satisfied the clauses in the contract. That's fascinating, and, and that's certainly something that's interesting to those of us in, in, in this conversation with, with who are legally trained and those of us listening. So I, I want to unpack that concept a little bit more. But, Jonathan, let me just turn it over to you real quickly. Have, do you have any direct experience with uh, Bitcoin? Have you used it, uh, the technology, as a currency, or uh, you know, do you have any direct experience with it? I have no direct experience with it. No, I have you know, certainly no opposition to it, but I think I would, I would need to learn more about it, which I am today, uh, before I would dive in. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, you know, keep, keep talking at me, Jeff. You're, you're selling me. <laughs> so, so, Jeff, let me, let me ask you this. You know, we've got, you, you, we've, we've inter you've introduced the concept <laughs> of the smart contract, these verifiable transactions so that you could use the technology to prove that something actually has happened. And, you know, I certainly am not aware of any situation where there have been lawsuits, let's say, for breach of contract, where the manner of payment was in Bitcoin, where, let's say, for example, somebody wants to buy goods and uh, they got issued a, a purchase order and part of the requirements were like what you were talking about, the CTO and the CEO have to sign off on the, the documentation. And then, you know, you can verify that those conditions for the enforceability of the contract have been met. Let's say at some point in the future, a lawyer comes to you saying, Jeff, I want to hire you as an expert because I've got to go to court and prove that the uh, that the transaction took place, that these certain conditions to the contract were met. And, you know, we've got to show that, that the, fa the reality is what the reality is. The facts are what the facts are is what we're alleging here. And we're going to use this technology to demonstrate that a certain version re of reality is true. How would you go about analyzing that situation and uh, unpacking the problem? What kind of questions would you ask? What kind of technology, what kind of information would you need to see in order to serve in an expert capacity, helping uh, somebody out in a lawsuit in that way? Well, one of the uh, uh, very useful uh, attributes of this technology and, and upon which uh, smart contracts, Bitcoin itself, is all built upon is uh, simply uh, cryptographic digital signatures and uh, other uh, uh, digital techniques whereby you can prove in software with 100% certainty that a condition did or did not exist. And so if uh, I were uh, called upon in an expert capacity, uh, typically the first thing that you would look for is uh, the digital signatures which were uh, uh, created by the parties in question using uh, cryptographic software. And that's, uh, for Bitcoin itself, that's all behind the scenes once you uh, type in your password, as it were, then so let's, uh, let's stop it right there before it sites. gets too sure. Sure. Before it gets too complex, what would that look like? And let's keep it really simple because remember, you're going to be presenting this to a judge who might very well be, well, I don't want to introduce any ageism in here, but you know what I was about ready to say. You know, somebody who doesn't, you know, have a, have a good grasp of this thing. And the moment you say cryptographic key, their eyes will have glazed over. Let's make it real simple what it is that you'd really need to get into to, to look at, to start demonstrating that, that the signature had, had occurred. Well, uh, uh, b before answering that, I would say uh, I would jump to an even higher level in that uh, uh, smart contracts are, are really more 
they include their own enforcement regime, I guess is the best way to put it, is that uh, not only do you have a uh, provable way of saying this person did or did not transfer the funds, but uh, in uh, Bitcoin's case in particular, the fund transfer is irreversible. And so even if you uh, take, uh, you go to a court of law in your jurisdiction, the funds are not going to be immediately recoverable through that course of action. And uh, by extension, uh, that it, it, Bitcoin is really introducing the notion of where uh, software and the decentralized network that cross-checks each other are really providing the enforcement regime as well as the rules. And the enforcement regime is uh, clearly defined by uh, math rather than by a, uh, a human legal system. And so uh, answering that question, I, I tend to say it in most smart contracts, you've already had the enforcement executed. And if you're in a court of law, you're really, uh, you know, it's sort of like a murder happens. Uh, you know, you're punishing the, uh, the attacker, but the crime is irreversible. And so you're just cleaning up the damage at that point. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, um, I guess what I what I would also want to sort of sort of cover is that that notion you were talking about earlier about property, the ownership of property. I think you touched on it very briefly about, and, and you were talking about it in a pretty intriguing way before we actually went live, about ownership of property within the chip. So it's property, owning property. What was that? Can you unpack that concept that you were, that you were introducing there? That's, that's pretty intriguing. Absolutely. It, uh, I, I think that uh, the Bitcoin technology, or, or to be more specific or, or more general, decentralized technology, really introduces some interesting concepts with regards to private property rights. And uh, that is uh, if you can have a computer chip that can generate a random number that fulfills the minimum requirements necessary to have what's called a Bitcoin wallet, which is the minimum requirement to hold digital value. And since Bitcoin is entirely digital, entirely programmable, if you control a Bitcoin wallet, you can hire people, you can buy and own property, you can invest in investment schemes, you know, uh, all this is stating the obvious, but uh, there's one crucial interesting point which many people really haven't thought of before Bitcoin. What if the thing controlling the Bitcoin wallet is a thing and not a person? What if it's a car? What if your car can uh, invest in other cars, or if it's an autonomous vehicle, which uh, Google already has uh, on the roads, what if your autonomous vehicle decides that running a Lyft or Uber service is very profitable, and your car decides to invest in another car, and so on. So it, it really posits very interesting ideas for private property rights where uh, a thing can own a property, and there's no uh, entity behind that, no corporation behind it, no single person that's both potentially criminally liable, civil, civilly liable, or uh, in and in general just uh, controllable. How is that different than the situation where you've got a computer deciding what stocks to buy? and sell because those are that's the application of algorithms to make decisions that affect the disposition of property and results in the allocation of funds the transfer of funds help me understand a little bit better the issue you're putting your finger on here by differentiating it from that well i'd say there are two key differentiators uh, uh one being or the the main one being is that uh those high frequency trading algorithms are not really autonomous they are performing a function automatically but basically given a goal directed at a high level by a human being somewhere along the line and then from a legal perspective you still have someone or someones who are legally liable, usually that's a corporate entity in this case, 
Though uh, uh, another interesting uh, posit from the Bitcoin community is what if you had a corporate entity with no uh, uh, humans at the top that itself was a uh, set of software rules being executed. So there again, you, it poses interesting legal liability questions of you know, who gets sued if something goes wrong, who's responsible. Yeah, yeah. This is a concept that that comes up from from time to time on the show. There's two sides to the to the coin. No Bitcoin pun intended. Uh, you know, there's this idea of the liability, the responsibility that these agents have. And just sitting aside for a moment, the controversial question of when that agent becomes autonomous and self-aware and may have consciousness and what have you. But assuming that that actually does arise as an emergent property, the other side of that coin is what rights does that entity have? If, it ha if it's sentient, if it has feelings, if it can make decisions and acquire property and dispose of that property, well, then ought it not be able, ought it not be able to vote for example, or hold political office or, or something like that. Jonathan, have you ever given any thought to notions like this about, uh, really, it's a l the larger question of artificial intelligence and uh, the what, where the responsibility should be traced to if uh, there is some sort of malfeasance uh, arising from autonomous systems like what, uh, what Jeff's talking about? I've given scant thought to it. You know, my research hasn't taken me into that area, but uh, you know, certainly there would be you know many, many hundreds of law review articles that could be written about that. You know, different dimensions of it. Um, but no, unfortunately, you know, I, I don't have any kind of specialized background or expertise to offer on it. Yeah. Well, you know, that's that's never stopped uh, stopped me before from pontificating on, <laughs> on these things. So, well, you know, let's, let's leave Bitcoin technically, but, you know, I, I want to weave it in through our conversation, um, you know, as we continue on here. But I want to turn the attention to uh, a topic, Jonathan, that, that you raised. There was a, a new law uh, that was signed, uh, Vladimir Putin signed it earlier this month, that really cracks down on online speech. Jonathan, why don't you unpack that a little bit for us and tell us what's going over there in Russia with, with online speech. Sure, yeah, there was a, a new law passed. It was uh, in early May in Russia that requires um, online voices, so these are bloggers, uh, to register with the government. And that would give, of course, you know, the government a really wide ability you know, to track who says what online. Um, and in, in a broad sense, what this does is borrow a page from you know the playbooks of places like China, uh, places like you know Turkey, Egypt, uh, that have you know long restricted uh, access to the internet and have long restricted particular types of content uh, that's available on the internet. Um, it's colloquially called the Blogger's Law, and uh, basically it specifies that any site with more than three thousand visitors daily uh, will be considered a media outlet in Russia. Uh, akin to a newspaper, and that therefore it's going to be responsible uh, for the accuracy of the information published. Um, in addition, the law tells bloggers that they may not remain anonymous. Uh, and so organizations that provide platforms for their work, you know, like search engines, um, uh, they have to maintain you know, computer records on Russian soil of everything posted over the previous six months. As a number of critics have pointed out, you know, the law, it, it's, it's very likely to cut the number of critical voices and you know, the number of opposition voices. It, at least it will mute those voices. Um, and then around the same time, he, uh, Putin signed a, another law, uh, separate but related, uh, insofar as it stands to restrict speech. Uh, but this is both offline and online. Uh, and it heavies uh, or it levies uh, heavy fines for using, you know, common four letter vulgarities uh, in the arts. And that would include literature, movies, plays, TV, any of those distributed online or off. Um, a few months before these developments, there was another law passed in Russia that gave the government the power to block websites. And um, what Putin did, he, his, his government immediately used that against uh, many of the, the most vocal critics. And you know, all of this is done against a backdrop of uh, Pew polls, you know, Pew research polls uh, that have been conducted recently showing that 
uh, roughly, you know, it, it's well over 50 percent of um, uh, people in in Russia and around the world and even in other uh, authoritarian nations like Turkey, uh, that the vast majority of their citizens support uh, free speech and uh, oppose government censorship of the Internet. Um, and so when I look at this, I think that, you know, this is the problem of, of government restrictions, certainly. But I think it's important to consider these issues using um, a wider lens to include private restrictions on content, too. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, to borrow a phrase from Rebecca McKinnon, the Internet scholar, uh, you know, the sovereigns of cyberspace like Google, Facebook, Twitter, and so on, they're writing the current chapter in the story of free speech. Um, they're conducting private worldwide speech regulation, and they're doing so by writing, um, interpreting, enforcing their own edicts about what type of content is permissible and impermissible uh, on their platforms. Um, in, in doing that, what they're really doing is developing a de facto free speech jurisprudence. And that's a significant development here because of the tremendous power of those companies and, and private platforms to shape public discourse. And so, you know, online communication is going to continue to prolifer uh, proliferate and the platforms enab enabling that, they're, they're trying to be flexible, I think, so that they can strike you know, what they would consider to be the proper balance among democratic values, legal obligations, and business interest. And to put it another way, this is the way that you know, Jonathan Zittrain put it from Harvard. He said that um, companies are benevolent rulers uh, trying to approximate you know, the kinds of decisions they think would be uh, respectful of, of free speech as a value, but also of, of human safety. Um, and so, you know, companies that are based in the United States, Google, Facebook, Twitter, and so on, they, they enjoy a First Amendment freedom of speech that encompasses the right to make their own policies regarding what type of speech they host. Um, and, you know, because they're private rather than government actors, you know, seemingly they're not constrained by the First Amendment. You know, they can set whatever rules they want. Um, and they also are bound to comply with the local laws of every country where they operate. Otherwise, they could create some serious potential liability. So, you know, one of one of the outstanding issues here with regard to the to the Russian uh, bloggers law is, you know, will large international social media or search companies like Google, like Twitter, like Facebook, will they really have to keep their data, you know, in Russian databases or face fines and, and possible uh, closures? Um, you know, I, I don't know. That's not clear from the face of the law. Um, and if, if you take more broadly, you know, the issue of private companies operating as arbiters of free speech in a global scale, I think that you would find no better example of that than um, it would have been not this last fall, the fall before uh, in 2013. Uh, or 12, rather, uh, the Innocence of, of Muslims video that was posted uh, on YouTube a couple of times by the same person. And, you know, it the it's a very long, involved story, but, you know, the short story is that um, there was a man who developed a screenplay uh, for what turned out to be the Innocence of Muslims video. And the original screenplay focused on the life on life in Egypt uh, more than 2,000 years ago. But in editing, the trailer was, was edited and overdubbed to basically dramatize the life of Muhammad. And it incorporated scenes based on slurs about him that are often you know, repeated by, by uh, people who you, know, you might characterize as Islamophobic. And the clip was clearly designed to offend Muslims. Um, you know, when the New York Times reported on it, you know, they, they basically you know, said that the trailer opens with, with scenes of Egyptian security forces standing idle, you know, as Muslims pillage and burn the homes of Egyptian Christians and, and so on and so forth. And, you know, it, it uh, depicted the Prophet Muhammad as a child of uncertain parentage, a buffoon, a womanizer, and, and many other you know, terrible things. Um, this created a really interesting problem for Google, the parent company of YouTube, which again was hosting uh, the, the video. Um, there were protests raging in the Middle East at the time, you know, flaring in Yemen, Nigeria, Iran, Jordan. Um, as they flared, you know, Google began acting as an arbiter of free speech, uh, restricting access to the video here, leaving it unrestricted there, you know, all while performing you know, a delicate balance that normally is performed by courts uh, in these areas. And 
Google ended up blocking access to the video in Egypt and, and Libya, citing the very difficult situation in those countries. You know, there was a lot of violence raging in those countries then. Um, some of it connected with the video, some of it not. And in other parts of the world, Google blocked access to instances of, of Muslims where the video, either on its face or by, by inciting riotous behavior, it violated local laws. Uh, so again, you know, I, th I think that when you when you consider the effects of of any restriction on online speech, you have to consider the wider lens because I think in an ideal world, we would have a single global internet and we would have a governance structure that would reflect it. And when individual countries do things like Russia did with its bloggers law, you create these really small jurisdictional silos. Uh, where you're basically cordoning off you know, your network from you know, freer networks around the world. Um, and you know, I, you know, I, I think that there ought to be on the part of the companies, so Google and a couple of other major American Internet companies announced in response to the Russian bloggers law that they were reviewing it to evaluate how they would comply with it. And... One thing that I guess I, I would encourage internet companies to do, and you know, this is not news to them in any way. I mean, they're you know, companies have, have pulled out of countries where they believe that they just can't operate, you know, consistent with their principles. You know, I would encourage them, you know, thoughtfully, thoughtfully to continue to do that. Um, and I would also hope that they would be more transparent uh, about the decisions they make and the bases of those decisions. So, you know, again, returning to that innocence of Muslims um, example. When they were making decisions, you know, country by country, whether to leave the video up, uh, they released one singular statement uh, that, that basically said, you know, we work hard to create a community where everyone can enjoy YouTube. You know, this is really hard because speech that's offensive here might not be offensive there and vice versa. And they said that, you know, the video um, in your jurisdiction is going to remain up uh, because it does not uh, violate our community guidelines. And it was really no more particularized than that. And it made it very difficult when you were looking country to country uh, to apply the, um, the criteria that the companies used, you know, to make that decision. And so, you know, I guess my larger point is that, you know, we don't really know where the greatest threats to free speech in the web in the next decade are going to come from. You know, they could come from China. They could come from Russia and Iran, you know, where political censorship is commonplace. They could come from European countries. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we saw, you know, laws, uh, you know, European Union decision uh, that, that would require inter Internet companies to remove post uh, search engine results, rather, that, you um, uh, that, that offend, you know, that could offend or otherwise, you know, defame without, as a technical matter of law, defaming uh, somebody. You know, I, I guess I don't know, you know, where these great threats to free speech will come from, but they are many and they are varied, and this is certainly one of them. There's all this talk about restriction and keeping stuff either off the web or certainly being restricted from getting to certain classes of, of internet users. And these are largely efforts of governments. And as you're articulating, Jonathan, often in collaboration or uh, conspiracy, if you want to be a little more negative connotation about it with large internet companies, the, the intermediaries. Jeff, let me ask you if there's anything for us to talk about in discussing this, these efforts of restriction in framed by the question of whether or not it's even plausible or possible to do that, or in other words, whether it would be entirely futile for governments to try to restrict the, the, the presence of speech or the delivery of certain content to certain users. And, and what I'm trying to borrow from is the concept of information wants to be free, which you identified as one of the key things that had to happen for Bitcoin to gain prominence and, and, and widespread adoption. I wonder if you'll talk about, you know, what you think about restriction and, and if, for example, pointing to, to, to Russia here and it's a blogger's law, is it just, is it futile in the first place? What do you think of that? It, it, it approaches futility, yes. It's uh, my uh, information wants to be free. I, I frame it as an en engineering statement. And what I mean by that is that uh, digitally, information will always be easier to copy and to leak than to keep it secret. And that's why it only takes one Edward Snowden or uh, Bradley Manning, et cetera, 
to uh, leak an entire government's worth of secrets, assuming that uh, they are digital, which in this digital age they increasingly are. Um, with regards to uh, uh, just uh, the NSA and uh, uh, the Russian uh, thing, I think there are uh, quite a few parallels. Uh, with the Snowden disclosures, uh, what we saw was increasingly that encouraged other countries to develop what uh, Jonathan described quite aptly as information silos. And you saw a bit of a uh, move in particular by governments, but also by some corporations to uh, pay more attention to where their data is located geographically. And uh, unfortunately for us, uh, they tended to choose outside the United States. Now, that uh, also has implications for, for example, in Russia and China, where free speech is uh, much more restricted and the press has uh, much more control, direct control is uh, that that technology itself often enables uh, it a, a, grit, a restrictive or repressive regime to easily restrict information flows in gross or in mass. And so naturally, uh, anyone who wants to restrict information and restrict speech, they're going to, uh, and referencing uh, John Robb's uh, Brave New War here, it's a fascinating book that uh, really urges everyone to look at uh, the economic costs and ROI of, uh, of any attack, whether that's political, etc., is uh, it's from an engineering perspective and a cost perspective, very easy to use technology to repress speech from large flows of information, whether that's large websites, and that's why they're going after websites with larger than 3,000 users, or broadcast mediums such as uh, television, where it's easy to uh, impact the source. But information wants to be free, and you can never truly restrict the flow of information as long as free-thinking people exist in this world. They're, uh, they will always find a way to encrypt or change their behavior in such a way that uh, communications uh, get out. I think that's, that's the larger lesson of history is that even before the digital age, information uh, always leaks out. So uh, while I think that, and this unfortunately for me is an, an engineer, but uh, I think that technology will continue to uh, enable repressive regimes to restrict speech, but uh, that's countermanded perhaps by the axiom information wants to be free. One of the things we have to do on the show here, or one of the things that we choose to do to facilitate folks who are listening and hoping to get uh, professional credit, whether it be CLE or, or what have you, is drop in some catchphrases or some passphrases uh, to prove that you listened and report to the agency. So we'll make the first CLE passphrase for this episode, restrictive regime. So if you're listening for CLE, restrictive regime. Uh, Jonathan, would a law like this ever uh, pass? Uh, would it ever fly? Would it ever uh, remain in effect in the United States like the, the blogger's law? Uh, no, no, not, not a chance. Uh, it would be immediately struck down as a First Amendment violation. Um, and it, it would be seen, you know, in part as a prior restraint um, a well, just historically, one of the reasons we have the First Amendment is we were trying to get away from a British licensing system uh, where printers and publishers in Britain, this was around the time of the revolution, uh, they, the king required all printers and publishers to come to him and to ask for permission to get a printing license. And you had to pay a fee for it. Uh, the licenses were not freely given, and they were certainly never given to uh, anybody who would criticize the king, uh, the king's officers, or the church. Um, and so, you know, this 
what it did, it created also an economic incentive for the licensed printers to rat out the unlicensed printers. You know, their, their bootleg printing was a uh, you know, big business back then. Um, but there was an economic incentive for the licensed printers to go after the unlicensed ones uh, because you know, they would be able to drive business, um, drive you know, their competitors out of business you know, simply by turning them in. And you know, obviously that system had a tremendously restrictive impact uh, on free speech. You know, at the time of the revolution in Britain, uh, we imported that system to um, to colonial uh, America. And then that was one of the reasons why we drafted the First Amendment. We wanted to get away from that. And we wanted to uh, prevent the government from creating a licensing system here. And so if you were to try to create, you know, a list or criteria uh, that would determine, you know, that this person qualifies as a journalist, this person doesn't. You know, for example, if you created a um, a qualifying exam, you know, like the bar exam um, or the medical boards, you know, that would also violate the First Amendment for the same reason. We don't want the government in the business of making decisions about who gets to do journalism and who doesn't, because the, you know, the margin, the room for error there is just far too significant you know, for government to begin picking and choosing based on content. Uh, so then you could have a content-based restriction on speech uh, directly or indirectly that also presumptively violates the First Amendment. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background on, on prior restraints here, you know, for example, if the government came in and the U.S. government came in and said, well, um, you know, we are not going to permit anybody to publish, you know, unless they come to us and get a license, um, you would fly in the face of some of the strongest First Amendment cases in history, um, among them uh, near v. Minnesota. Uh, 1931 case. Um, Anthony Lewis, once uh, the the former New York, the late New York Times writer, once described that as the first great free speech case in the United States, and that case said that you know speech may be prevented only in exceptional cases. And the example and the context of that case was you know to protect troops in a time of war. Um, and so you know the the general idea that flows from that case, from cases uh, in its progeny. Are, you, the, the basic idea is just that you know we're not going to let the government do that uh, get it, get in the business of of deciding you know, who, who may do that, and you know I'll, I'll qualify all of this by saying that certainly there are places where um, extra governmental bodies uh, and governments do kind of sort of get into the business of of um, decide. Who's a journalist and who is not? And one easy example would be with uh, reporters' shield laws. Uh, first, the First Amendment-based privilege, as well as statutory shield laws, um, retraction statutes, uh, also arise raise these issues. And so do credentialing practices uh, for government agencies. And so, if I just use as an example the shield law, uh, in order to qualify for uh, the privileges given to a public communicator by a shield law. Uh, a shield law, by the way, it gives a public communicator uh, in certain circumstances the right to tell a court that you are not going to testify about um, your sources, about any unpublished information that you may be sitting on, uh, things of that nature. And the, the threshold question in any shield law case is do you qualify for it? And in order to evaluate whether you qualify for it, federal courts, state courts all around the country have developed varying criteria to, uh, to uh, determine who fits and who doesn't. Um, some of them are quite narrow. They focus on employment by traditional you know, media. Uh, others are quite broad um, and you know, uh, quite easily accommodate you know, changes in technology uh, and bloggers. And so that is an area right now that you know, we're seeing a lot of movement in. But you know, just to, to circle back, you know, plainly the answer to your question, could, the, could something like that ever happen here? Uh, no, no, it couldn't. Another facet of this that seems like it would offend I mean, the First Amendment itself and also the hardwired sensibilities that we as Americans have because of our free speech rights is the idea of anonymity, you know, having to turn over your information to the government. And that raises a, a bunch of, of different issues. Jeff, what do you think about anonymity uh, and the lack uh, or the, the, er, the effect that eroding anonymity has on the restriction of, of speech. And feel free to talk about it in this context. And then uh, also the sort of the 
illusion of anonymity, if you will, when it comes to, to Bitcoin. Can you talk about that as a concept? Well, uh, yes, but uh, first I'd like to uh, respectfully disagree with Jonathan a bit uh, with the can't happen here. Um, and think about, I ask you and your audience to consider money as speech. And uh, what I mean by that is that one of the interesting aspects of Bitcoin is, uh, as the activists term it, monetary freedom. Uh, the government can't tell you what to do with your Bitcoins. They can't freeze your bank account. And uh, to uh, make this concrete, consider WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks was receiving donations via MasterCard and Visa, and they had all of their routes of funding slowly terminated uh, through various back channels and uh, a term that I'll revisit in a second, de-risking. And uh, more recently, there is uh, uh, something uh, you can Google for, Operation Choke Point, which uh, was originally created to squeeze uh, very, very usurious, uh, a thousand percent interest payday loan lenders out of the biz out of the business by denying them bank accounts. And what uh, that is uh, now being used for is we're seeing increasing reports of, for example, adult film stars, which uh, the government feels are a high risk, are being denied and uh, having their bank accounts closed. And so you see uh, through not a direct channel on free speech, which uh, I do maintain that the United States is the best country in the world when it comes to uh, protecting free speech rights. But uh, that being said, if you consider money as speech, the ability of myself to donate to a worthy cause that the government might find radical or the uh, you know, simple uh, engaging in a business, uh, for example, the, uh, the adult business, which the government finds a little bit uh, controversial or immoral, the government is in the United States uh, directly going after those funding sources and closing them off. And so while not directly censoring speech itself, uh, the controlling of money is uh, 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 pretty much the same thing that I w as I would argue. So uh, I would uh, respectfully disagree that uh, they uh, are not uh, going after free speech. You just do it through back channels. You uh, control the strings that control the strings. Everyone has to eat. Everyone has to pay rent. Even, uh, even long-haired activists uh, need to uh, buy their Starbucks coffees. So uh, <laughs> you, you just recently got a haircut, right? When was that? <laughs> was sometime. Uh, Jonathan, let me give you the opportunity to to, to respond to that. And and mm -hmm. if anybody'd like to talk about anonymity, I would love to steer the ship there at some point too. Jonathan, sure. Yeah, just a quick response. You know, I I certainly would never ever make the argument that there are not challenges and threats to to free speech in in the United States. I mean, as as press freedom correspondent for the Columbia Journalism Review, I wouldn't have a job uh, if that were the case. Um, and I think that, you know, what Jeff has outlined is a related but separate issue. Um, you know, I, as a, as a plain matter, um, it would not be possible in the United States to pass a law, you know, that would license journalists in the same way that the Russian bloggers law would, you know, which was, which was the question at issue. Um, and I agree with him that there are plenty of ways for intermediaries to uh, basically operate as choke points on speech. So one of the points that I make in some of my, my classes I teach in, in media law is that you know, new media, they're changing our capacity to speak. And to put it in the terms of you know, a lot of old famous First Amendment cases, you know, that means that more people can speak more easily than ever before using the Internet and mobile networks as their modern day leaflet or printing press. Um, today, though, you know, the technology behind that speech, it's vulnerable to choke points and to surveillance. And I think that both of those things have the potential to endanger the global ecosystem of free expression and a large amount of speech. Um, 
you know, I say global because uh, we've moved in the world through trade and foreign investment and travel to a point where there is a degree of interdependence among all nations um, that demands a global marketplace of ideas, a global Internet infrastructure. And as Lee Bollinger, uh, the president of Columbia University, you know, once put it, um, you know, we can expect censorship anywhere to be censorship everywhere. Um, to me, the problems of choke points and surveillance, they're related um, and, you know, to, to circle back to the, well, I, I'll give you just a few other examples. So I'll begin with the example, um, you know, that Jeff gave, and that's broad, broadly thinking about that. That's the problem of, you know, payment service providers uh, acting as an intermediary between you and your audience. So, it, you know, payment service providers, PayPal and whatnot, you know, they, they make it possible for users to send and receive payments online. They bridge the gaps between senders, financial institutions, and receivers. Um, and, you know, online donations through those services, they can provide the support necessary to political causes, to candidates, to activists. Uh, they can fund journalism on a site like Spot Us. They can fund poetry books on a site like Kickstarter. Um, you know, they both rely on crowdfunding to finance story pitches and art projects, uh, respectively. Um, the threat here is that government and private actors can pressure those payment service providers to cut off a speaker's means of financial support. The threat would apply, I think, chiefly to sites that engage in controversial speech, you know, which is not to say it's unprotected speech. It very well could be, uh, but it's controversial and therefore easily uh, and, and, and frequently targeted. And so, yeah, you know, in 2010, uh, WikiLeaks really struggled to cover its operating expenses because PayPal uh, and other services bowed to government pressure and stopped processing the organization's donations. Uh, for a while, the only way to donate to WikiLeaks was by sending them um, uh, money or a check to a physical mailing address that, that was at a, a, a post office box uh, out of the country. And so, you know, I think that putting aside any personal views, you know, any, anybody might have about WikiLeaks or Julian Assange, I do think that it's a considerable, uh, um, it, it's of considerable importance that we have to be vigilant against, you know, payment service providers being conscripted into the service of censorship. Uh, you know, other intermediaries that can be targeted like that, um, you know, web hosting services. So, you know, these obviously allow you to host your own website. You know, the service could be small like Angel Fire, could be large like GoDaddy. Um, these are very often the recipients of defamation or copyright claims, demanding the takedown of hosted material. You know, some of the demands are, are imminently legitimate. So a photographer demanding that a website remove um, an image used without authorization. But some demands are not so legitimate. You know, where you file a... Uh, you know, a DMCA request or some kind of takedown um, um, letter with the express intent to get the content taken down for a little while just to make it go away uh, so that nobody has access to it. Um, another intermediary that can be targeted, search engines. They, you know, the leading engines, you know, Google, Bing, and Yahoo, they're becoming magnets for censorship, I think, in large part because you just can't get around the web without using one. Um, some authoritarian governments, they block entire search engines or they force them to blacklist certain queries, uh, all to limit access to websites and materials that just don't fit, you know, the government's official version of reality. Uh, a good example of that would be until 2010, uh, Google had agreed to censor its search results in mainland China. And then when the company ended that agreement, uh, Google began routing all of its Chinese traffic through Hong Kong servers, you know, which were beyond the reach of Beijing censorial laws. Uh, so mainland users can still use Google, but the connection breaks if they search for certain terms. So, you know, it's no longer Google um, uh, basically conspiring in the censorship. It's the government and you know, the so-called Great Firewall of, of China. And then you know, the last little intermediary example I would give you is um, third-party platforms, um, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. You, know, you, you can send private messages. You can post public content. And for many people, these platforms are their principal means of online communication. And unfortunately, some of these platforms, when hit with takedown requests or legal threats, you know, they opt for the easy solution of simply taking something down uh, or banning users. And some of them in the first place just didn't develop um, – I, I guess clear, um, uh, clear, easily administrable 
content rules and guidelines. So then it, they're kind of mired in a mess of their own making, trying to make individual decisions that, that um, in practice turn out to be very inconsistent. Um, and then you, you, you overlay that with the problem of, of you know, increasing numbers of state laws. And by state here, I mean, I mean nation, uh, you know, national laws that uh, attempt to require these companies to um, regulate the content that's posted. So, you know, the European Union's decision a couple of uh, a couple of weeks ago is a good example of that. Uh, Argentina has had a law like that on the books now for I think it's more than a year and a half, maybe two years. Um, you know, Europe has very different conceptions of privacy than we do here in the United States. So, uh, you, you know, I I think you know I would agree wholeheartedly with you know Jeff that there are there are so many you know there are many many dozens of iterations on you know threats to free speech uh, online uh, and that and that we need to be vigilant about all of them and i think one of the challenges here is that many of the legislators who are drafting laws and policies in these areas you know some of which i think purport to protect civil liberties I question whether they fully comprehend the technology that they're attempting to regulate. You know, but at no, any they rate, don't, you know, it, they don't comprehend it, it at all. <laughs> that's, that's right. Um, so yeah, you know, I'm 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 wary of of all of those efforts. You know, the good, the bad, the ugly, uh, and you know, again, if there were no threats to free speech, I would be out of a job. One of the things that really strikes me about the Russian law is having people to register. And, you know, and I'll go ahead and introduce the topic of anonymity, which, you know, I want to talk about here and the effect that 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 the government knowing about who you are and what you're saying, you know, what that what that has to, you know, what what, what role that can play on on restricting speech. So let me just go right back to you, Jonathan, on that. I mean, would a law that required people to just simply register their identity online, you know, so that you can always tie a particular um, identity online with an actual user. Would that pass constitutional muster in the United States? I don't think it would, no. I think it would run right into the bandsaw. Uh, it's, a, I think, a 1995 or 1996 case, McIntyre v. Ohio. Uh, it's a case that in a different context, it's an offline context, uh, but it provides for a right of anonymous speech on political and social matters. Uh, the issue there, I believe, is political leafleting and pamphleting. Uh, but uh, David Goldberger, who is the counsel on that case and won that at the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, he was actually my advisor and mentor in law school, and I did. It was an interview with the Harvard Law and Policy Review about a year and a half ago uh, on that issue, on anonymous speech online. And I went back to him and I asked, you know, there's been raging debate about whether McIntyre, you know, applies in the online context. Because in 1995, you know, the Internet, to state the obvious, was very, very different from the Internet that we have today. And so I wondered whether, you know, not contemplating the Internet as it exists today, uh, in, in 1995, could that 1995 case apply? And David said, yeah, that there would be, you know, in, in my reading supports that, that, you know, there are no principles in that case that would limit it uh, to an offline context. And I think that you know, there are a couple of other issues to bear in mind here. One of them is a point well made by Jack Balkan, uh, the uh, right chair in constitutional and First Amendment law at Yale Law School. And he wrote, it was a, a law review article, God, it was in the last year, year and a half, something like that, uh, in which he's talking about the importance of democratic culture and free expression to the Internet and kind of throwing those concepts uh, up against one another. And the argument that he makes is that the purpose of freedom of speech is to promote a democratic culture. And he, and he says that a democratic culture is more than representative institutions of democracy, and it's more than deliberation about public issues. Um, you know, rather, a democratic culture is uh, one in which individuals have a fair opportunity to participate in the forms of meaning making you know, that constitute them as individuals. And so, you know, with that in mind, democratic culture is about individual liberty as well as about self-governance. It's about each person's liberty to participate in the production and distribution of culture. So looking at it that way, you know, free speech is a system and people exercise their freedom by participating in that system. Uh, they interact with others. They make new meetings and new ideas out of old ones. Uh, and when you couch all of that stuff in internet speak, 
free speech values, you know, interactivity, mass participation, the ability to modify and transform culture, those things have to be protected through, you know, not only laws, but technological design and through administrative and le uh, legislative regulation of technology. Um, and, and then, you know, you would obviously have, you know, the more traditional method of judicial creation and recognition of constitutional rights, you know, including those under the, uh, under the First Amendment. Um, um, the question of anonymity also raises um, a, an issue that you know we may discuss further in a little bit, but I'll just toss it out really, really quickly right here. It, it can affect for groups that are not engaged in journalism per se, but maybe they just express themselves about public issues. Uh, it can implicate the freedom of association. And there's a case pending yeah. right now, uh, First Unitarian Church of Los Angeles v. NSA, uh, that where uh, 22 different organizations, including Unitarian church groups, uh, they are suing the NSA for violating their First Amendment right of association by illegally collecting their call records. And one of the arguments embedded in that case is that um, you know, privacy in your associational ties is closely linked to freedom of association. And you know, the theory here is that um, you know, you may induce people to withdraw from an association and you may dissuade others from joining an association because of fears of exposure of their beliefs, you know, shown through their associations and of the consequences of their exposure. Uh, so, you know, just a slightly different way of looking at the anonymity issue. So, again, that wouldn't really apply directly to a Russian blogger situation because that seems to be targeting journalists. But if they said, hey, you know, anybody who expresses themselves on public issues, you know, like an association, and then they said, now you may not be anonymous. We need to know everybody who is associated with you and writes for you. That would implicate freedom of association issues, too. There's an interesting situation that brings in these ideas and it brings in well and, and by these ideas i mean uh the freedom of association anonymity and also bitcoin the recently the federal elections commission uh introduced regulations that allow donors to send donations to political candidates via bitcoin and to uh donate to um political action commission or committees as well PACs you know, up to $100, which is, I guess, the, the limit on the law anyway. And um, there's the, the, the federal law requires, this is a pre-existing federal requirement, that donors be um, identified who they are, what they work for. And so we could, we, we could explore the idea of whether that's constitutional because it would seem to impact your freedom of association uh, you know, your freedom to associate with certain political candidates, but apparently that passes constitutional muster. But, but what I really would like to do to move the conversation here is, Jeff, ask you the risk that certain commentators have identified. I want to go to you to see if this is a valid risk. Uh, and, and I don't want to go to the, to the idea of um, the false assumption that Bitcoin is anonymous. We, we know that it's not anonymous, but it, you know, it, it, it at best can obfuscate somebody's identity. But is there a real risk that some commentators have identified that if you make a donation to a political campaign using Bitcoin and also comply with federal regulations that require you to identify yourself self as having made that contribution, including your workplace and all that stuff. Is there a risk that that's going to jeopardize the anonymity you may have established in the uh, blockchain, the transactions in the blockchain, both in the past and in, and in the future? Can you comment on that? Uh, in a word, yes. The uh, anonymity as a general problem is very, very, very hard. Um, but uh, to answer that specific question, uh, a lot of people, myself included, think that Bitcoin is actually too public and uh, it needs more consumer privacy protections if it's going to achieve wide success. As uh, right now, uh, you can transfer to me, let's say, one Bitcoin. And if uh, others in the world know that that transaction exists, it's very easy to uh, look through the transaction blockchain. That's the timeline of every single transaction since January 5th, 2009. 
and look through that timeline of transactions and see that uh, Mr. 123 sent one Bitcoin to Mr. 456 at this specific date. Now, you don't know who Mr. 123 and Mr. 456 are, but uh, just like the NSA analyzes telephone metadata and uh, discerns the connections between people, you can analyze the blockchain data and discern the same information. And so for that reason, uh, if, for example, I was looking over your shoulder while you were buying a Starbucks coffee with Bitcoin, it uh, might be uh, straightforward for me to then go to the blockchain and examine that transaction and look at related transactions. So uh, it's not trivial to unpack the privacy, but it is definitely not anonymous, as you noted. And that uh, is one reason why some people would like more uh, mixing or uh, sort of uh, uh, switching up of the coins and values to uh, make it harder to trace, because right now it's very easy to trace. But in general, moving beyond Bitcoin itself, anonymity itself, if you're an activist, is very, very, very hard. The, uh, even if you encrypt, for example, all your telephone conversations and your electronic conversations, the connections that you make each time you communicate are also a digital footprint that you leave. Anytime you walk down the street, as we know from watching uh, popular Hollywood uh, movies and TV shows, those are data points which can easily be uh, processed through biometric software, etc. And so as technology advances, as uh, cloud storage and cloud processing costs continue to decrease as they do year over year, it becomes easier and easier for not just the NSA, but for uh, any tin pot dictator or local law enforcement department or uh, corporation uh, to run their own NSA, so to speak, with biometric software, with tracking, etc. And with that in mind, uh, all of that is pushing against uh, your personal efforts to be anonymous. And so it's, I think we're, due to technology itself, headed to a future where privacy has to be, it really needs to be a constitutional amendment or some very strong laws. Otherwise, technology is just going to sweep us all by and we'll uh, wonder where all our privacy went. That's such a such a compelling issue, and you see that in some of the different litigation going on against the NSA. That uh, you know there were there were a, hand, a handful of cases filed last summer after the the Snowden revelations. In one of the cases, ACLU versus Clapper, the judge in that case held that um, you know the, the the job of the NSA in evaluating these relationships that can be ascertained from the analysis of vast amounts of data is very important. It can pick up on very transient or very ephemeral relationships. And the judge, uh, Pauly, in that case, alluded to the fact that maybe 9-11 wouldn't have happened had the NSA uh, surveillance program uh, been in place before 9-11. Isn't that a provocative thing to say? But then you've got the other, you know, the same same reality. You've got the situation in the case called uh uh, I guess, yeah, this was the, the Clayman versus Obama. This is where Judge Leon was talking about how, uh, I'm just reading from the case, saying that he could not possibly navigate these uncharted Fourth Amendment, you know, right to be secure in your, your persons and your effects and information in the cloud. Uh, these Fourth Amendment waters using as my North Star a case that predates the rise of cell phones. The point being we're creating so much more information, as you're talking about, Jeff, the processing power and the ability to analyze that information to draw conclusions really is a strong threat to, uh, to, to, to our privacy. Uh, in the in that uh, in that front, I'd, Jonathan, I'd describe oh, oh. it as even stronger than that. Is that I I would say that it's a, a threat to freedom of association and freedom of thought itself. Because when your every uh, move can be tracked, every single tire in a car has a uh, RFID tracking chip in it. It's trivial to uh, track license plates, and uh, we all have smartphones, so we all 
uh, voluntarily pay for our own Orwellian tracking devices. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah, the, it, if you consider all those data points, we are all perhaps not consciously, but we're all opting into a global tracking system where technology already makes it easy to track the every single real-time whereabouts of your entire population. And when you consider that, you consider how what are the impacts on uh, political speech itself? What are the impacts on freedom of association? And that uh, very famous NAACP case that Jonathan referenced, it, uh, freedom of association simply won't exist. I've often uh, wondered what it would be like someday if nanotechnology develops to such a point where today's drones seem like uh, prehistory, where you could have you know, quadrillions of nano devices being released into the environment at the subcellular level to infiltrate every cubic inch of space within a jurisdiction with extremely high resolution capability of gathering all different types of data, including within the uh, organisms that inhabit that data and in the brain and, and imagine a network of, of, you know, unfathomable numbers of nano devices actually essentially being able to read the thoughts of each of our individuals. You know, there, you, can, you can get pretty crazy pretty quickly thinking about what could, what could happen in the future. It just seems to be a natural extension of what you're talking about there, Jeff, this idea of just more and more information, more and more data points can be connected in a, in a higher resolution picture of each individual to, to, be, to be painted. Right. You, you, you think Abs- absolutely. Like and uh, DARPA, in fact, has uh, already been uh, that's the uh, experimental research arm of the Department of Defense. They are already experimenting with uh, insect sized drones. So uh, you can imagine a fly on the wall being a literal high tech, uh, high definition surveillance device. Yes. Um, but uh, over and above that, uh, there, there's a lot of interesting research. One of, the, uh, one of my other favorite examples is that an fMRI can be employed to read your mind. Uh, existing tests have demonstrated where test subjects will see a set of images, a car, a house, a banana, etc. And then the MRI machine, which has been uh, hooked up to a computer doing nothing, nothing but simple statistical analysis, will uh, then recall what you are thinking at the time you saw those images. And by extension, once it learns your brain patterns, it knows when you're thinking about a banana, a car, or a house. So we all uh, emanate these uh, uh, wonderful little electrical signals, which uh, at present are very difficult to monitor. But uh, many people seriously uh, theorize that your brain waves could be monitored. Those silly uh, guys with tinfoil hats might not be so silly 10 years from now. Yeah, I hope that the tinfoil will keep, keep the stuff out. <laughs> so I want to I wanna get onto the issue of the death penalty, as if we haven't talked about enough provocative issues already in our conversation here. But to, to make a segue into that, I want to latch onto the idea of anonymity and identity, because this does play a role in this story, Jonathan, that has become very near and dear to you. You've written about it very eloquently uh, recently, and it's the idea of this problem that you've identified, and the other commentators are talking about. And there's actually some litigation over it, having to do with government secrecy and the uh, concealment of information about the drugs that states are using to impose the death penalty on their inmates, and uh, how this this plays into the Eighth Amendment guarantee against having to endure cruel and unusual punishment. But Jonathan, you've so well brought into it a First Amendment angle. Can you uh, take what I'm talking, uh, I have rolled up there and sort of unroll it and uh, give give a framework of, of, of how this issue looks and, and what your thinking and analysis is along these lines? Sure, yeah. After both of you have terrified me with all the talk of the nanotechnology invading my personal spaces and brains, I was about to disconnect from this call just to go preserve my naivete. Um, yeah, the issue here with 
death penalty secrecy, um, much of the secrecy that we see today, it stems from these are efforts by prison officials in the last, oh, I would say three to five years uh, to procure lethal injection drugs after major manufacturers were pressured by the European Union uh, to prevent their products from being used for capital punishment. So a number of states, um, Oklahoma among them, you know, freshly in everyone's mind from their botched execution uh, a few weeks ago, to turn to what are called compounding pharmacies. And they're located in the United States. They are lightly regulated labs that mix drugs to order. Uh, their quality control has been a significant concern. Um, in the last six months, there were two, um, at least two men uh, who were executed um, through an injection of compounded drugs. Uh, one in Ohio, uh, the man gasped for more than 10 minutes uh, after being injected. And uh, this was a different Oklahoma man, not the one executed you know, just a few weeks ago. Um, but after he was injected with compounded drugs, he, he was reported to have said, I feel my whole body burning. Um, what states have done, despite concerns about quality control, or as I have noted in, in an article, you know, perhaps because of those concerns, you know, some states are, are beginning to shroud in secrecy more pieces of their execution protocols. Uh, some of them even are arguing that drug manufacturers themselves are part of the execution team whose identities are routinely kept confidential. You know, that has long been the case, that the actual executioners, uh, they, they are able to maintain their, their um, confidentiality. Um, around the country, these secrecy practices have triggered a lot of legal challenges uh, in Louisiana, in Georgia, in Missouri, uh, and elsewhere, you know, obviously in Oklahoma uh, most recently. As I mentioned uh, in, in an article I wrote on this about two weeks ago, you know, judicial independence there died a quick death. You know, irony intended when the, when the state Supreme Court, it stayed the execution that turned out to be um, a botched one. Uh, they stayed it in advance, which means that, you know, for those of you who are not you know, steeped in the law, uh, that just means that they delayed it. You know, they put a stop to it. And um, then they reversed course uh, a couple of days later after the governor refused to honor the stay and a state lawmaker introduced it was impeachment proceedings against the justices on the state Supreme Court who voted for the stay. Uh, so you know, most of the discussions about these issues have focused on the Eighth Amendment uh, and due process implications. So you've got uh, death row inmates arguing that secrecy prevents them from investigating, you know, uh, whether drugs or improper dosages would violate the Eighth Amendment's ban on cruel and unusual punishment. And then on the other side, you've got prison officials arguing that secrecy you know, is necessary to protect you know, the execution team members, again, including you know, pharmacies, compounding pharmacies from uh, credible threats of violence. Um, I think that those are really, really important concerns. But in a piece I did, you know, I argued that the constitutional questions at play here are even broader than that. And, um, you know, without going so far as to say as a matter of fact that this thing exists, you know, I, I do believe that you can make a principled argument that the press and public may have a qualified right of access to information about lethal uh, injection drugs protected by the First Amendment. Uh, and... The argument that I make, and I am drawing here from the work of a, a guy named Nate Kreider, uh, who is a third-year law student at Columbia and who is uh, in the process of publishing a, a lengthy scholarly piece on this himself. Um, the argument is that the First Amendment assumes a special importance here because of the relationship between the first and the eighth. Uh, the first is essential to realizing the safeguards of the eighth's prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, and so, the, the, you know, the angle is, is that you've got a, a long line of cases now at the U.S. Supreme Court uh, where traditionally the court interpreted the First Amendment to create a negative right that prevents the government from restricting protected speech. Uh, but since the 1940s, a body of case law has emerged focusing on you know, the audience's right, your right and mine as readers, uh, as viewers, as listeners, to receive information. 
And in some cases, the court has held that right requires the government to provide the press and public uh, access to information that is uniquely in its possession. Uh, this has come up in the context of prisons. It has come up in the context of court cases, uh, of jury selection hearings, of, of preliminary hearings in court. Um, and then if you, if you kind of jam all of that together, you know, I, I, I conclude that um, if, if you want to make a case for a First Amendment right of access to information about lethal injection drugs, you know, what you have to do is you know, focus on the audience's right to receive information, and you have to acknowledge the importance of that information to the court's analysis of whether a particular execution method violates the Eighth Amendment. Um, I won't you know, drone on here, but I'll just you know, make a couple of final points about the death penalty secrecy stuff. Um, Correctional facilities, you know, have not been traditionally open to the press and public, but, you know, I kind of view executions as a sort of proceeding in the presumptively open criminal justice system. You know, it's the closing chapter, as I, as I described it in my, art, in, my, in my piece, of a long book of trials and appeals. And historically, executions themselves have been open, you know, and, and they've been conducted in ways that have left little doubt of the exact mode of death. Um, you know, the actual process of killing a convict remains open to media observers today. Uh, and, you know, states, yes, have long shielded the identities of the executioners themselves. But I'm aware of no practices or policies that have shielded, you know, historically speaking, you know, rope makers, bullet makers, blade makers, which conceptually would be the equivalent of uh, a compounding pharmacy. Um, and I think that this is especially important because... Um, the shift to compounding pharmacies and the flawed executions that followed, they have raised really serious questions about the integrity and effectiveness of new and, and largely untested drug combinations. Um, the press and public simply can't evaluate whether a state's execution method creates you know, a risk of violating the Eighth Amendment if the press and public don't know where the drugs wrong, wrong uh, ingredients came from, um, whether they come from a reputable producer, whether the finished product is pure and sterile. Um, and, and essentially, you know, I, I, I go back to a line that Thurgood Marshall once included in, in a dissenting opinion in a death penalty case. And the quote is this, the opinions of an informed public uh, differ significantly from those of a public unaware of the consequences of the effects of, of the death penalty. And here, you know, we have a public very unaware of uh, the, lethal, the lethal injection protocols used. Uh, and, the, and the legal issue is, you know, whether a state can withhold from the public certain information about the way the state kills people. So there's a lot of objectors out there who just say, you know, you're dealing with murders and rapists and child rapists and, 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 and what have you. So why care in, in the first place? And, you know, why put all these resources behind trying to ensure that the, the process is there? And I know the quick answer is to just say, well, it's the Eighth Amendment. It's the Constitution we should value these constitutional principles. And okay, I can, I can buy that, that we ought to not, um, you know, trample over any portion of the Bill of Rights, the Eighth Amendment included. And, and no matter how uh, loathsome a person's crime was, they enjoy those protections because that's the Bill of Rights that, that we were given with. But how would you answer those objectors in really saying that it's important from a First Amendment perspective to make this tie between the First Amendment and, and the Eighth Amendment. Can you, can you, you know, elaborate on that particular point a little bit, Jonathan? Sure, yeah. I think that it's really important to note that, you know, the issue here, it's not about the propriety of capital punishment. It's not about the terrible offenses that many of these people have committed. It's not about their victims. Uh, their victims, yeah, I even mentioned this in the article that I wrote, um, you know, they are largely and tragically lost in the coverage of many executions, and that is particularly true of, boxed, of botched executions, you know, where all of the focus there is on, you know, what the state did or didn't do. And so, frankly, I think that you could probably do a service to the victims and to the system itself if uh, you would address that and remove those questions. And an easy way to remove those questions and those criticisms uh, is simply to open up the process a little bit more. Uh, you know, in addition to that, I think that you know, the, the main import of a First Amendment argument and interest here is that uh, we ought not trust the government. Uh, I think that, you know, if this was put best by um, 
it was Megan McCracken and Jennifer Moreno who, who work in the death penalty clinic at, at Berkeley's law school uh, in a New York Times essay that they wrote a, a couple of months ago, you know, where they basically say that if prison officials conceal cru crucial information from judges, lawyers, the public, you know, we have only their word. You know, that the drug will cause death in a manner that complies with the Constitution. And you know, I don't think that we can leave that to trust. You know, I think that you know, leaving things to trust generally is something that the press and public and democracy can't afford to do. Um, you know, I, I think that you know, no government regulation should put the press and the public in that position, you know, especially where um, the, the government, and this is an argument that's made you know, very effectively by um, – uh, a guy named Vincent Blasi, who's a First Amendment scholar, um, that you know, the government has the unique capacity to employ legitimized violence. And in a society where that is true, that I think means that the freedom of uh, speech and freedom of the press are so incredibly important because that is the press and public's check on the unique capacity to employ legitimized violence. You know, we, we generally are not lawfully permitted to rise up in violence against our government. Um, and so the way that we check them is through speech. And, you know, we cannot evaluate, you know, the propriety of a capital punishment system, uh, how the capital punishment system operates, if we don't know anything about it. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's, I guess, kind of the broader point for me that, I, and it, it's not that I'm paranoid here, it's that there is, uh, strong evidence that states have quite badly um, managed parts of their execution protocols. So if you look at Missouri, there's a guy named Darren Lee, who's a correspondent for the Columbia Journalism Review. And about a month and a half ago, uh, he did a, a long read on, uh, it was the execution protocols in the state of Missouri, and was looking at um, their attempt to conceal from the public the identity of one of the state medical doctors who is involved in the execution process. And he was responsible for, I believe it was administering the lethal cocktails. Uh, what came out of that investigation was that uh, originally news media were told they could not publish the identity of that doctor. Uh, news media ended up doing that, and now the state has gone after the news media. The ACLU of Missouri has gotten involved, and the issue is now at one of prior restraint, where the question is, can you prevent a news organization from publishing the name? You know, once that name has been lawfully acquired by a news agency, can that news agency publish it, or can the government institute a prior restraint on that publication? Um, and the, 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 the important facts here are that the doctor, it was revealed, uh, had been um, sued uh, quite a few times for medical malpractice, had been barred from practicing medicine in certain areas, and ultimately as a result of those revelations was removed from his position, having been deemed unfit for it. These things we never would have known, and, and his removal probably never would have happened if we had not um, had you know, the, the disclosures and the, trans and the forced transparency in that case that we ultimately did. One thing that seems that, that could be going on here, and I don't want to be too cynical about it, but I'm just taking the, the, you know, trying to see what certain commentators might have to say about this, is that what this is really by bringing it into a First Amendment context is really smoke and mirrors to just be anti death penalty. You know, you say, oh, you, mm -hmm. most, you, you might think that, oh, well, people who have some objection to the death penalty for whatever reason, you know, might be more of a progressive sensibility or, or, or what have you. I don't want that, to, that's not the point of my comments here to, to label or anything, L are looking for reasons to point out why the death penalty should be done away with altogether. And that this First Amendment uh, argument is just a way to sort of shoehorn in another argument against that. So uh, just a couple of questions. I want to just get your answers on this quickly, Jonathan, because I want to move on and, and eventually wrap up here is, um, you know, I, I guess that I could boil it down to one question. Is there anybody who's coming at this from the First Amendment angle who otherwise may be labeled someone who has pro-death penalty, who hasn't otherwise in other contexts come gone on record saying the death penalty ought to be done away with altogether. What do you what what about that? 
You know, I'm, I'm not sure specifically, you know, if I'd be able to identify somebody you know, like that. I mean, in, in the interest of, you know, full disclosure, you know, I, I don't support the death penalty. Uh, it's not really a moral issue for me. Uh, it is an issue of I, I see too much room for error in uh, the system, in the criminal justice system. Uh, there's too much bias in it in general. Uh, and there's just the margin is too high, I think, to exact that kind of final judgment on somebody. When you look at um, you know, post-conviction DNA uh, exonerations. Uh, there have been, you know, many, many, many hundreds of those uh, in the last really eight to 10 years. And, you know, I am convinced that we have put to death people who, you know, many, many people uh, who I'm sure in fact were, were innocent. And so, you know, it, it's, that is my chief problem with, with the system. Um, and, you know, so I come at it from the perspective of somebody who, you know, doesn't like it, but, uh, you know, I, as an attorney, you know, can put that aside and say, okay, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to peel away this one issue to look at it. You know, I, I really think that if, if you were to make the argument that, you know, every time you criticize, you know, one element of the death penalty, that what you're trying to do is overthrow the whole system. You know, I don't know that that is, um, I, I'm sure that that would not be true in all cases. Uh, but, you know, I'm sure we'd be able to find someone if we looked hard enough who would, <laughs> you support the death penalty so long right. as it would be reasonably and safely, you know, administered. Um, and, and really, you know, in, in my piece and in my analysis of it, I've, I've kind of shunted that question off to the side where I just don't consider that relevant to my analysis. Uh, even though, yeah, you know, in, in the interest of full disclosure, you know, I don't like it. But again, it's for very practical reasons rather than uh, moral reasons. You know, I'm just... Uh, I, I'm afraid, you know, at least if, if we if we sentence somebody to life without parole and then we realize 15 years later or 20 years later that we made a mistake, at least it's not too late then to attempt to unring that bell. You know, if we put somebody to death, yeah, you know, the, the bell is rung. You can't unring that. Uh, so, you know, just. General thoughts there on that, but but no, yeah, the First Amendment argument, at least my approach to it, um, it, it was a genuine good faith approach where you know I, uh, I I was not looking at it as intending it to be any kind of smoke and mirrors broadside on the system itself, and in fact, if you look at my closing paragraph in that piece, you know I, I say that even if a state's capital punishment system is less than perfect for the circumstances, at least it can be transparent. So you know if we make the decision as a state, you know, whether we are Ohio or Oklahoma or, or Louisiana, if we make the decision as a state that we believe we should have the death penalty, and if we accept as a matter of fact, which I think is inevitable, that there will be problems with it, um, the very least it can be is transparent so that we can identify those problems when we see them and we can resolve them immediately you know, to comply with, with constitutional mandates. Good deal. I need to drop in another CLE passphrase here. So if you are listening for CLE credit in your jurisdiction, we'll do as a second CLE phrase, exoneration. And so if you're a lawyer looking for CLE credit, you ought to know how to spell that too. So I won't bother spelling it. So Jeff, let me turn it over to you. Let me get your comments. This is, uh, you know, it's an intriguing and, and provocative topic. What, what, what are some of the things you're taking away and, and, you know, going through your mind when you hear uh, what, what Jonathan is, is putting forward so, so articulately? Well, uh, democracy dies without transparency. Uh, it is absolutely crucial to democracy in general, speaking from general principles, that we have transparency and sunlight. And uh, to uh, draw an analogy to Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin, interestingly enough, uh, posits not that you trust the creator and the, the smart guys who created the software, but it is open source. It's entirely open to inspection. And so the entire system, all its flaws, et cetera, are open to inspection. And moreover, uh, the, uh, the currency transfers itself, et cetera, they are all cross-checked by hundreds of thousands of computers all over the globe. And so uh, to draw an analogy, you have not only transparency, but cross-checking. And I think that uh, that's what's uh, lacking in uh, some of the procedures that Jonathan was describing is it's uh, clear that transparency, additional transparency is needed at every level, particularly when a human life is at stake. 
Very good. Very good. Well, that was uh, that, that's an interesting interesting topic. We could talk about that all afternoon, no doubt, but we do need to think about landing this craft at some point. So here in the next uh, little while, let's talk about our resource and tip for the week. Our resource of the week uh, comes from uh, Cash Hill, Cashmere Hill uh, over at Forbes. She's a friend of the show, has been on Twill a number of times. And she wrote a piece earlier this month about her experiences she'd gone through yet again here in 2014, a similar experiment that she did in 2013, living a week only on Bitcoin. So she wrote a piece, 21 Things I Learned About uh, bit about <laughs> Bitcoin living on it a second time. So some of the things that uh, she observes are that it was easier this year. Uh, last year, she had to walk everywhere, move out of her home and lost five pounds. This year, she ate a 17 course dinner, went on a wine tour and used ride sharing services. So um, Jeff, did you take a look at, uh, at Kashmir's article and uh, you know, to what extent uh, have you uh, tried to live on Bitcoin to the exclusion of more traditional, conventional methods of of currency? Absolutely, and I've been uh, attempting what she's been attempting for years now. It's a very interesting chicken and egg process where, when you're rolling out a new currency and it's not a large corporation or government behind it. Uh, you have merchants who uh, wonder, should I take Bitcoin? And naturally, they're not going to accept a new method of payment until they have customers that have it in their wallets. And customers are not going to have it in their wallets until they have businesses at which they can spend those, uh, that new currency. And so it's uh, a really unique grassroots experiment. Uh, and uh, very slowly uh, over the years, I first got involved in July 2010, which makes me a very old man in the Bitcoin space. <laughs> I uh, have been uh, selling, uh, for example, goods, you know, from uh, your, your little lawnmowers and your Craigslist items to I've been uh, listing real estate properties for Bitcoin as well. So every uh, transaction that you perform in Bitcoin is one more sort of step in building the Bitcoin economy, as it were. And uh, my uh, weekly uh, pizza and beer get together with some of my uh, buddies is uh, paid for with Bitcoin. I'll uh, use that to uh, buy a gift card, which uh, in turn uh, lets you uh, get you know, whatever your favorite brand of pizza is, whatever your friend, uh, favorite brand of uh, adult beverage is. So uh, Bitcoin is really making inroads in uh, those areas of life. There are property managers who are accepting Bitcoin for rent. Um, just about any basic staple you can uh, buy with Bitcoin, just as you can buy with dollars or euros or yen. And it's, uh, it's a really fascinating uh, social experiment. You meet uh, all sorts of new and interesting people and you get all sorts of new, interesting and uh, quizzical looks when you first talk about, uh, hey, uh, would you accept Bitcoin for this instead of dollars? But uh, most people's curiosity usually wins out. And uh, it's a lot of fun talking about uh, this strange new internet currency. Kashmir in her article cites to data suggesting that 75% of people still don't know what Bitcoin is and 80% wouldn't consider using it. But she does say anecdotally that uh, in the Bay Area, at least, and by anecdotally, I mean, I, I suppose that she means, you know, people she's talked to, she'd say at least 75 percent have heard of it, though many were skeptical about using it, which, you know, doesn't seem too surprising, a higher awareness in the in the Bay Area. And finally, I thought it was funny what she said toward the end of the, the piece that about whether she'll do it again next year. She said, I might start feeling like Mitch Maddox. Do you remember Mitch Maddox, either one of you, Jonathan? You remember him from around 2000. Jeff, do you remember Mitch Maddox? I surely yeah. don't. He was AKA dot com guy. He legally changed his name to dot com guy whose claim to fame was living on the internet during all of 2000. You know, hardly an impressive feat now, but you know, he bought everything. <laughs> he, he never, I don't think he left his home in 2000. He ordered everything off the internet, which, you know, no big deal now. So, which These seems days, everything would get delivered via drone. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it's not just ordering it on the internet, but actually not having it ever touch a conventional mode of transport would be would be the, the intriguing thing. So, all right, our uh, our tip of the week. Uh, we got this from a tweet that you put out recently, Jonathan. Um, and uh, by the way, everybody should be following Jonathan at Jonathan W. Peters uh, on Twitter. It says to my former Mizu 
students who graduated Friday, remember what I told you. The keys to success are confidence, class, and cat memes. That sounds like a tip. Jonathan, what's going on there? <laughs> Basically, if you had the misfortune of suffering through any of my lectures, uh, you would find that my PowerPoints are a little bit unusual. Uh, I include a lot of memes on them. I've got a lot of videos that I uh, splice into them. And, you know, cat memes, are among my favorites. So on the last day of class, I always give them you know, a little bit of life advice mixed in for what it's worth, along with some more substantive material. And so I just, I just feel like the more cat memes, the merrier. I mean, nobody's ever gone wrong with a cat meme. So, so I mean, that, that's it. That, that really, I, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure how I'm a professor. It amazes me every day that, that they keep letting me come back and have not preemptively detenured me. So watch out, University of Kansas. The cat memes are on their way, <laughs> right? to do that. So. <laughs> All right. Well, Jeff, wonderful to talk to you. Really enjoyed meeting you. Tell folks uh, where we can go and find out more about you online and keep track of, of, of what you're up to. Well, uh, bitpay.com is uh, the, uh, that's where I seek my employment every day. But uh, bitcoin.org is where you can find out more about uh, Bitcoin itself, both the currency and the technology behind it. It's an open source project. Anyone can join, anyone can contribute. Uh, take a listen, take a read. And you are on the Twitter as well. Where, where's that over there? At Jay Garzik. Very good, very good. Jonathan, awesome to see you again. Thank you so much for coming back. Absolutely, Evan. Thanks for having me. And tell folks how uh, they can keep track with you. What, what's uh, where? You know, I already mentioned your Twitter handle. Well, uh, Twitter handle handle. <laughs> where else out there can we uh, learn about Jonathan Peters? Uh, Twitter handle is usually the best. If you also would, if you just Google Jonathan Peters and uh, CJR or Columbia Journalism Review, uh, you can find all my pieces there. Um, and I guess more generally, if you just Google, you know, Jonathan Peters and First Amendment or Media Law, uh, you'll get a lot of stuff that I've written or that you know I'm commenting on uh, one or the other. Uh, but generally, the Twitter feed's the best way. Very good. Well, thank you both for, for being here. And thank you all out there who are watching and listening, folks in IRC as well. Uh, as you know, if you're listening to this live, that means you tuned in at 11 p.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern on a Friday morning slash afternoon, depending on where you are. But find us at uh, twit.tv, also on YouTube and other ways that you get your content like this. Denise will be back uh, next week, and I'll be co-hosting, uh, of course. Uh, send email to us uh, throughout the week. We love hearing ideas for topics on the show. Denise is denise at twit.tv. I'm Evan at twit.tv. Follow me on Twitter at Internet Cases. Check out my blog, internetcases.com. Lots of fun. Enjoyed interacting uh, with you folks today. So until next week, we'll see you then. 